All right, kids, we're off to the races. Last and final physics lecture. It's kind of sad. This isn't at all how uh, I wanted this to end, but hey, this is the hand that we're dealt, and uh, we'll make the most of it. So here we go. So now I want to look at what happens in the nucleus. And I'm going to tell you now, when you get into this whole thing, just, just accept it. Don't think about it too much. You're just going to end up in the fetal position, sucking your thumb. Worse yet, you're going to end up doing potentially something illegal that could harm your body. Just accept this. Because once you get into the world of atomic physics, it, it just gets weird. So just accept it. Maybe because it's 720 on a Friday night, and I'm giving the last lecture, and I haven't had dinner, so... I don't know. We'll see what happens. All right. So let's look at what Rutherford did. So if you remember Ernest Rutherford, it was a great story in and of himself. Okay, so if you ever get bored, research Ernest Rutherford. So Rutherford did the gold foil experiment. So he shot alpha particles, and he called them alpha particles because he didn't know what they were. So he shot these alpha particles at a sheet of gold foil, and most of the time these particles went straight through without any deflection at all. But every once in a while, every once in a great while, like once every million times, what would happen is that this particle would come close and it would turn around and it would bounce back. Well, if you look at it from an energy standpoint, this is what we call the point of closest approach. So basically what happens is that the kinetic energy that the alpha particle has has to equal your UI that you're going to store. Oh, okay. Well, that's kind of cool. So then, your kinetic energy is going to be one-half mv squared, which is going to be your alpha particle. Okay, so that would be the mass of your alpha particle. Then, this is going to be your UI, which is kq1, q2 over r. So if you solve for r, which is going to be that point of closest approach, so this is going to be your k value. Now, I move multiplied by 2, so that's where that comes from. And then you've got the two positive protons from the alpha particle. You've got the atomic number of gold, which is 79. So you've got 79. And both of those would be multiplied by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. This would be the mass of the alpha particle, and this would be how fast it's going. So you could actually figure out exactly how close this thing is going to get, and that's what we call the point of closest approach. Now, a quick refresher out of Chem 1. So, and we're going to be using this system. So when you see a symbol written like this, you're going to have two values. You're going to have a mass number, which is shown by the letter A, and then you're going to have an atomic number shown by the letter Z. Now, everybody always asks, well, why didn't we let the atomic number be A? That would make sense. I've never known exactly why. The only rational, rational thing I could come up with is they wanted to stack this where you have A on top and Z on the bottom. Now, but here's what's going to be important. Remember, your mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons. Sometimes this is referred to as the total number of nucleons. So there's only one situation where your atomic number and your mass number both equal one, and that's when you have your most abundant isotope of hydrogen. Every other time, your mass number is going to be bigger than your atomic number because this is the total number of protons and neutrons. So also coming out of quick one, out of uh, Chem 1, quick refresher. Remember that isotopes have the same atomic number, but they have a different mass number. Now, always remember this, and this is going to play out large later on. The only thing that determines the type of atom it is is the number of protons. And it is only the number of protons that determines the type of atom. Not the number of neutrons, not the number of electrons. Now, speaking of electrons, if you do have an imbalance, okay, so let's say, for example, you might have 
an imbalance between the number of protons and electrons. So you might have something like, you know, sodium uh, 11, 22 plus. So if you get this full symbol here, remember here's the number of protons, here's the number of electron or number of nucleons, here's the number of protons, and that's going to indicate that it's lost one electron. Okay. Now, on the Balmer series, so what the Balmer series does is that it allows you to calculate the wavelength of light that's being emitted from an atom. Now, I'm never going to expect you to be able to do the Balmer series calculations, okay? I'm not. This is just kind of general knowledge in terms of an understanding of science. So this is one of those deals that we never, the, the Balmer series worked beautifully. So M was the, basically, your, your ground state. N was your excited state. And so basically what they did is by a series of trial and error, you took 91.1 nanometers, you divided it by 1 over m squared minus 1 over n squared, and that got you your wavelength. Now, this worked beautifully, and it was just a matter of trial and error. It took them about 30 years to actually figure out exactly why it worked. So there's, there's going to be some problems like this on your assignment. I'm not going to expect you to know, know how to do them on the test. All I'm doing is just showing you this because it was one of the kind of cool things that came out of this whole atomic spectrum thing because it allowed you to look at this and go, okay, right. We don't know why it works, but if you plug in the right numbers, you get the correct wavelength of light that's being emitted. Now, if you do a little bit of a parlor trick here and you solve this thing, sometimes it's handy to... Uh, solve for like a particular wavelength depending upon what you're trying to do so just a quick refresher on algebra so all i did was multiply this quantity over and then divide it back by the wavelength so then to get like the least common multiple of n squared and m squared you've got n squared minus m squared over n squared times m squared so sometimes and you're, you're going to have a problem like this on your assignment where this is handy to have if you want to calculate a uh a wavelength or maybe solve for a value of n. So I'm just throwing that out there. Again, on the test, I'm not going to expect you to know this. This is just kind of a general thing that you need to know because the Balmer series, if you ever study optics, was one of the big things that happened. Okay, speaking of the nucleus. So this is a graph where you have neutrons on one side and protons on the other. So up to about 16 protons, which is about sulfur, what happens is that the number of neutrons, which is shown by the letter N, equals the number of protons, okay? So if you look at, like, for example, carbon-12, okay? Has six protons, six neutrons. Helium, okay? Two protons, two neutrons. So what this line represents is what's known as the line of stability. This gives a ratio of the protons and neutrons where you have a stable isotope. Now, up to about 16, these are generally equal to each other. After you get past that, that line of stability curves up. So what happens is that you have to have more neutrons relative to the number of protons once you get into more massive nuclei. Because what the neutrons do is they kind of buffer the nucleus and make it stable. So this is why this thing is called the line of stability. Now, there are some variations on here, okay? It isn't like completely like this, but it kind of gives you a general idea. So if let's say, for example, if you want to figure out if a particular nucleus is stable, track down the number of neutrons, track down the number of neutrons, see if it fits on that line of stability. If it does, it's probably going to be pretty stable. If it's way off of there, that nucleus isn't going to exist. All right, so what are the big things? Sorry about the on. 
that came out of this whole idea of Einstein and the, the development of nuclear power was something known as binding energy. So what they found out is that basically if you tear apart a nucleus, this binding energy is how much energy is released when you disassemble a bound system like a nucleus. Okay? So what that means is that if you take the sum of the parts, okay, the individual protons and neutrons, and you add them together, that's going to be less than the mass of the nucleus itself. Now, that difference in mass, there's two ways that you can do this. One is that you can find the difference in mass in kilograms, okay? And then you'd multiply that by the speed of light squared. Now, that's a long, arduous process. It can be done, but it's a long, arduous process. Typically, what we do to, to make this easier is that we use this 931.49, and your, your equation sheet on the AP only gives this as like 931, but your book uses 931.49, and that's generally more accepted. So basically, what this tells you is that if you have this mass in atomic mass units, so this is what I've got written over here, so this is why you have to use very, very exact numbers. And this is listed in the back of your book in Appendix D. So if you're going to use atomic mass units, like the mass of a proton, 1.007825. Mass of a neutron, 1.008665. So you cannot round these to one. So in Chem 1, you were told that each proton and each neutron has a relative atomic mass of about one, which is why if you look at like carbon 12, okay, relative atomic mass of carbon 12 is 12.00. Technically, it's not. Technically, if you actually go out and to a, to a large enough number of decimal places, this isn't true. Now, in Chem 1, when you're doing relative atomic mass and mole conversions, hey, use 12.0. It's fine. But if you're going to do when you're going to do these calculations for binding energy, you have to have these exact values. So if you want to store these into your calculator so you don't have to recalculate, which you do, so you don't have to punch them in every time, hey, fine, great, knock yourself out. It just might make life a little bit simpler. So let's say, for example, you want to find the binding energy of iron 56, okay? And remember, sometimes you'll see this written as Fe56, okay? So remember, when you see the symbol and then a dash, like, for example, carbon 12, that 12 or that 56 is representing the mass number, which is the total number of protons and neutrons. Okay, so if you want to find the binding energy... What the binding energy is going to tell you is how much energy is going to be released if you take this nucleus and you separate it apart into the individual protons and neutrons. So here's your basic formula. Basically, you take the total number of protons and you find the sum of all of those masses. You take the total number of neutrons and then you subtract the mass of the atom. So in this situation, I would have to give you, like on the test, or you're going to have access to your book, you would have to have the exact number of decimal places. Like you just can't round this to one, okay? So you'd have to look up in the back of the book that exact mass of that iron isotope, that 55.93490. So again, I cannot emphasize this enough. You cannot round this. So basically, you're going to take 26, which is the atomic number of iron, multiply that by the number of protons, 1.007825, 30 times the mass of each neutron, 1.008665. And so you notice a neutron is slightly more massive than a proton is. And then you subtract out the mass of the atom. And again, do not round this. Then, once you get this, then you want to multiply that by 931.49 MeVs per U. So, what this 931.49 represents is the conversion that allows you to end up with a binding energy in MeVs. So, 
the advantage of this is that you, if you're really hardcore and you want to work in joules, there is a conversion from like atomic mass units into, into kilograms, and then you can multiply by the speed of light squared, okay? You can do that. I don't recommend it. It's just so much easier if you just work straight into this, okay? That way you get MEVs. Anyway, all right, types of decay. There's three types. So you have alpha decay. So this is what Rutherford did. So what happens in, in alpha decay, and the reason that they called it an alpha particle was because they didn't know what it was, and it seems like, oh, hey, let's call it the alpha particle. All right, cool. So an alpha particle, once they figured it out, is a helium nucleus, which they didn't even know existed at the time. They didn't know the element helium existed because it was a very, very rare noble gas, so it didn't react with anything. So basically what happens is that a nucleus is going to lose two neutrons and two protons. So what you're going to see is a lot of radioactive problems are just simple math. You make the mass number add up, you make the atomic number add up. So let's say that you have a atom of uranium-238, okay? So the uranium-238 is what's called the parent nucleus. That's what it's going to start off at. Then what's going to happen is that it's going to undergo this decay, and it's going to kick out this alpha particle. So if nothing else, just make everything add up. So you got 234 plus 4, right? And that adds up to 238. Oh, okay. Because mass can't be created or destroyed. Neither can charge. So then on this one, 2 plus 90, check my math, is going to add up to 92. So... You're going to reduce the atomic number by 2. You're going to re reduce the mass number by 4 because you're losing two protons and you're losing two neutrons. And so what's left over is what's called the daughter nucleus. Okay. Now, with beta decay, with beta decay, there's actually two different types of beta decay. You can have beta minus and you can have beta plus. This is the beta minus is by far and away the most often occurring form of beta decay. Beta plus, very rare. So the, we're going to spend most of our time on this one. So basically what happens in a nucleus is that you take a neutron. That neutron changes into a proton. But to, to balance out the charge, you have to kick out an electron. So here's the dichotomy of beta minus. With beta minus, you actually add one to the atomic number because a neutron turns into a proton. But what's important is that you don't change the number of, or excuse me, you don't change the mass number or the total number of nucleons. So within the nucleus, you're not changing the number of particles. You're just changing a proton into excuse me, you're changing a neutron into a proton. So this is why the mass number stays the same. So what happens is that we went from an atomic number of six into an atomic number of seven. Now, notice what happens. Now, since we've changed the atomic number, and this is what I alluded to earlier, now I've changed the, the particle. So what would happen, and this is how they recognize this, is that you would start off with a certain abundance of, say, carbon-14. What they would find over a period of time is that you would see an increase in the amount of nitrogen in the system. Well, the only way that can happen is if this carbon is undergoing this beta-minus decay, you're kicking out an electron, and you would see an increase in the amount of nitrogen within the system. So... That's why I said here's the dichotomy of beta minus. With beta minus, you actually add one to the atomic number. So you go from six to seven or eight to nine or whatever that is. Now, and what the minus is referring to is the fact that you're kicking out an electron that has a negative charge. Some people like to think of it that way. I don't care, just think of it. Now, with beta plus, which is rarer, what happens here is kind of the reverse. A proton turns into a neutron, but you kick out something known as a positron. So a positron has the exact same charge as 
or excuse me, has the exact same characteristics of a proton, but instead of, but instead of having a negative charge, it has a positive charge, okay? So here's what you've got here. So let's say, for example, what would happen is that you've got magnesium turning into sodium. So here's the other thing. With beta plus, just like on beta minus, you add on beta minus. Oh, I did not mean to do that. With beta minus, you subtract one from the atomic number. So with this one, you've got you're starting with magnesium, then you're going to kick out a neutron, and or the proton's going to turn into a neutron, and you're going to kick out a positron. So again, you're maintaining the overall charge of the system. So you're going to kick out a positron. What would happen here is that you would see an increase in the abundance of sodium. Okay, now here's how you can tell that this happened. The, excuse me, here's the third type. I, I skipped one. So the third type that you can have is gamma decay. Now, gamma rays aren't really rays. They're actually very, very, very high energy protons. Excuse me, very high energy photons. So what happens on a gamma ray to create a gamma photon is that instead of like in, instead of taking an electron and moving it to a higher energy level and having it come back down and you kick out like a photon and you get red light or whatever, okay? Gamma rays actually involve an excited nucleus within this. So now you have like a, a proton going from one ground state to a higher ground state and back down. Well, that takes a lot of energy to make that happen. So let's say that you have tectilium, tectinium, and what happens here is that because of the fact that you're not kicking out any particles, you're not changing the number of protons, you're not changing the number of neutrons, everything stays the same, but you're going to kick out a gamma ray, which is just a very, very high energy photon. So gamma ray, gamma decay is simple because you don't have to change anything. You just kick out in a very strong, high energy photon. Okay, so now let's say that you have a radioactive source and you want to figure out what's happening. Well, so this is going to go retro back to a magnetic field. So here you got a magnetic field that's going into the page. Well, if you're going to go through alpha decay, you're going to kick out an alpha particle, which has a positive charge. So if you use the right-hand rule, okay, wait for it. If you use the right-hand rule, point your finger into the page, your finger is going to point up. That's going to be the direction of this force. So what's going to happen is that how you would know this is that you would have a detector here, like a collection plate. And what you would see is that you would see, if this is what was happening, is that you'd see a collection of these alpha particles striking this plate. And so like what Rutherford did, Rutherford used a phosphorescent screen. So phosphorescent screens, when they're hit with high energy particles, emit a flash of light. So if you're Rutherford, what you would see is that you would see flashes of light showing up here. And again, get out of your mind right now that you can actually see alpha particles. You can't. They're, they're like the nucleus of an atom. You can't see them. Now, if you go through beta minus decay and you kick out an electron, if you use the left-hand rule or the inverted right-hand rule, the electrons are going to flow down here. So you would have a detector plate down here. Now, but notice what's happening to the radius of curvature. The alpha particles are much, 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 much more massive because of the nucleus. So those aren't going to get deflected very much. The electrons, though, they're going to go whoop, okay? Because they're going to have, that's the exact sound that they would make is whoop, okay? And I can't, there we go. So we just go whoop. And those are going to get bent a lot more because of the fact that they have a much smaller mass. Now, the gamma rays, they're just a photon. They're not, going to interact, they're not going to interact with that magnetic field at all. Now, here's the last thing. Sometimes you're going to have what's called electron capture. So electron capture is kind of the reverse of what happens in beta decay. 
So what happens in beta in electron capture, as the name implies, a proton is going to gain is going to hook up with an electron. So again, notice that we don't change the number of uh, the mass number. But what happens is that the proton turns into a neutron and you kick out a neutrino. Now, neutrinos are these exceptionally, exceptionally weird little particles. And like for they come, there's a whole lesson you could give on neutrinos. There's three different types of neutrinos, okay, depending upon how long they've traveled. So right now, coming out of the sun, there's billions upon billions upon billions of neutrinos streaming through your body right now. Don't flip out, okay? They've been coming through your body since you were conceived. It's okay. They don't interact with anything, and neutrinos are actually one of the great mysteries of the universe, and we could, if maybe what they're trying to figure out is if we can figure out what happens with neutrinos, then you can figure out why we have more matter than antimatter, because theoretically, with the Big Bang, we should have had the exact same amount of matter and antimatter, and every time those that matter and antimatter collide, they revert back to pure energy. So if you were always had the same amount of matter and antimatter in the universe, then we wouldn't be here having this discussion. So something had to tip the proverbial scales over on the matter side and less on the antimatter side, and that's what they think maybe neutrinos have played a role in that. Okay, kids, that is it. It's Friday night. It's quarter to eight. I've been talking for quite a while. I am done. Uh, I'm going to send out this. I'm going to send out a link to a really cool um, explanation done by the BBC about the, what's called the standard model, which explains all of these weird different types of classifications of subatomic particles charms and photons and muons and gluons and all this good stuff. It's, it's pretty fascinating to watch. So I'll send that out as well. Kids, I wish I could at this point give you all a high five and see your smiling faces knowing that I've just given you your last lecture. But I have enjoyed it. We will. I'm, this isn't my, my farewell, but it's my farewell as far as trying to explain stuff. So uh, I hope I've done a good job of that. And hopefully you've learned some stuff along the way. And